Welcome students. Today we will start unit number 4 and the name of the unit is Tresses. Let us start the lecture. So let us first start with the definition of truss. So let us understand what is a truss. A truss is one of the major types of engineering structures which provides a practical and economical solution for many engineering constructions. Now we know in engineering field whenever we have to support some load we have to design some structures and truss is one of those structures. We have seen steel bridges and we have seen some structures also used to take the loads of the roofs. So the basic purpose of a truss is that it is used to bear loads. The truss consists of a framework of members which are assumed to be hinged at their ends. Yes. So if you see this particular truss, this hole is called a truss and it consists of different members. If I see there is one member over here, second member, third, fourth, fifth, there are so many members means this particular structure is made up of elements or we call those elements as members. So we can say that this truss is a framework of different members which are connected at their ends. They are commonly used in buildings and bridges and are designed to support loads and are usually stationary, fully constrained structures. Yes, so trusses are stationary. They are always in equilibrium and they are fully constrained structures. So what is the meaning of fully constrained structures? That the motion between the members is zero means there is no motion among the members. So members are also stationary. So these are fully constrained structures. Trusses may be seen in steel bridges supporting structures of large roofs, electrical transmission towers and roller coasters. Actually most structures are made of several trusses joined to together to form a space framework. Yes, of course, when we have to uh, support some load, we use uh, structures and in those structures, we have to use several trusses to take the load. Each truss is designed to carry those loads which acts in its plane and thus may be treated as two dimensional structure. It is a very important point to understand. So let us understand this point through this example. You can see over here we have used one truss and uh, one truss is used at the back and these two trusses uh, are used to take the weight of this roof or you can say the load of this roof. Now these trusses are loaded in such a way that uh, the load acts in the plane of the truss. So that is why we consider truss as a two dimensional structure also. So this is a very important point that whenever we load any particular truss, we load in such a way that load acts in the plane of the truss. So we can assume truss as a two dimensional structure. All external loads are applied at joints only. Thus, members of the truss are loaded in their axial direction and transmits load to foundation. This is another important point to understand. When we load a particular truss, then we load in such a way that all the loads are acting at the joints of the truss only. So what are joints? Joints are the ends where two or more members of the truss are connected. So that is a joint of the truss. So whenever we have to load a particular truss, we always have to load at its joints. And uh, it is loaded in such a way that these members are under axial load, means forces are acting along the members. So this is a very important point we should understand. So these two uh, points we should keep in our mind related to trusses. Cross sections of members can be I-section, channels, 
angles, circular rods, or any other shape required for specific application. So this is another important point that uh, the members which we use uh, in the truss to make the framework, those members can be I sections, channels, angles, circular rods, or those can be any shape uh, depending upon a specific application. So you can see over here we have used a square section and over here we have used uh, circular rods. The joints can be made by welding, riveting, bolting, etc. So when we have to connect these members to make the framework of a truss, then uh, we have different options. Either we can use uh, welding to connect those members or we can use bolting to connect the members or we can use rivets also to connect different members of the truss to make the framework. The joint connections are usually formed by bolting or welding the ends of members to a common plate called gusset. So when we have to connect the members of the truss, we use gusset plate and uh, over here actual application is shown. This is a gusset plate. You can see these members are connected to each other with the help of a gusset plate and uh, over here you can see the application of bolts to connect these two members with the gusset plate. So it can be done with the welding as well. So we have seen some important points about truss. Now let us see what is a simple truss. Trusses can be made rigid by repeating a procedure of adding two new members to the existing truss at two existing points of the previous truss and are connected at a new joint. So let us understand this through an example. Suppose we have a truss and it consists of three members let us say and there are three joints in this truss and it is supported at two ends and uh, let us assume that we want to make this truss more rigid then for that we have to connect more members so this definition says that if we use the previous two joints of the previous truss to make a new truss which is more rigid and we are adding two new members in such a way that those two new members are connected to each other and they are forming a new joint. So if we use this pattern to make a particular truss more rigid, then we call that particular truss as a simple truss. You can see over here he is saying, trusses can be made rigid by repeating a procedure. So what is that procedure? Adding two new members. So we have added two new members to this truss, to the existing truss at two existing points. So these were the two existing points of the previous truss and are connected at a new joint. So if we repeat this procedure to make a particular truss rigid, then that particular truss obtained will be called as simple truss. So next is compound truss. So what is a compound truss? It is formed by combining two or more simple truss together. So if you will combine two simple trusses together or more than two simple trusses together whatever truss or whatever structure we will obtain that will be called as compound truss. Now next we will see a few common types of trusses. First we will talk about roof trusses. They are often used as part of an industrial building frame and in these roof trusses the load of the roof is transmitted to the truss by means of purlins. Purlins are like beams. So you can see uh, the load of this particular roof is transmitted to this truss at uh, six different locations. One, two, three, four, five, six. So at these six locations we have used these beams you can see these are called as purlins so these beams are placed on these joints of the truss so the load of this roof is transmitted to the truss with the help of these purlins it happens in case of roof trusses 
and common types of roof trusses are scissors, prat, haw, and fan truss. So next common type of trusses are bridge trusses. So let us see what happens in bridge trusses. The load on the deck is first transmitted to stringers. So let us see where are stringers. So these are stringers. These long beams are stringers. So the load is transmitted first to stringers. Then to floor beams. So where are floor beams? So below the stringers you can see these are floor beams. These are floor beams. First load is transmitted to stringers. Then from stringers load goes to the floor beams. And finally to the joints of the two supporting side trusses. So you can see one supporting side truss is used here. Second supporting side truss is on the other side. Then from the floor beams the load is transmitted to the joints of these two supporting side trusses. In case of many long span trusses, uh, a roller support is provided at one end of a bridge truss to allow for thermal expansion. Yes, if you will see long uh, span trusses, yeah, then you will find a roller support at one end of that truss. This is done to allow thermal expansions. So common types of bridge trusses are Pratt, Haw and Warren. Now let us understand about truss supports. Uh, in unit 1 when we were discussing about equilibrium topic, in that topic we have learned about different types of body constraints. And in that topic we have learned about roller supports, rocker supports and pin supports. So now we will see those examples over here. You can see these are roller supports. So these are used at one end of the trusses to allow thermal expansion. So similarly we use rocker support as well. This is a rocker support and these are called as pin supports. So normally in a truss we use pin support and roller support. Pin support at one end of the truss and roller support on the other end of the truss to allow thermal expansions. Now next we will talk about determinancy. So by determinancy we mean uh, the unknown values which we have to find in a particular truss. So over here one truss is shown and uh, it is supported at two ends. These are the two supports shown. So in a particular truss there will be some reactions provided by those two supports. Like uh, if we have rocker support at one end or roller support at one end it will provide only one reaction normal to surface and if we have pin support on the other end that will provide two reactions at that particular joint. So in a particular truss we will have reactions and apart from reactions there will be the forces in different members of the truss. So the total number of unknowns in a truss includes the forces in x number of members of the truss and the total number of external support reactions are. Since the truss members are all straight axial force members lying in the same plane that we have already discussed. The force system acting at each point is coplanar and concurrent. So if you will see these forces, these forces are concurrent and these are coplanar. And we know the trusses are stationary and fully constrained structures. So that means trusses are always in equilibrium. So these three conditions of equilibrium are applicable to the trusses. And these three equations will be helpful for finding these unknown values. Means we can find the values of the reactions provided by the support or we can find the internal forces in the members of the truss developed because of the loading of the truss. So this we can find through these three equations. Next we will talk about statically determinate and indeterminate trusses. 
Now statically determinate trust means that we can find all the unknowns of that particular trust. And indeterminate trusses means we cannot find all the unknowns. Let us understand this through an example. Let us say M represents the number of members in a trust. So over here you can see how many members are there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 members. And let us say R represents number of reactions provided by supports in a trust. So let us say uh, over here both are pin supports. It means uh, each pin support will provide two reactions. So it means both uh, pin supports will provide four reactions. And let us say J represents number of joints in a truss. So let us see how many joints are there. One, two, three, four, five. So we have five joints in this truss and we have four reactions and we have how many members? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven members. If M plus R is equal to 2J, that means if we will add number of members in a truss and number of reactions in a truss and if that value is equal to double the value of number of joints in a truss then that particular truss is a statically determinate truss means we can find the unknowns in that particular truss but if we add number of members and number of reactions in a particular truss and if that value is greater than double the number of joints in that particular truss then that particular truss will be called as a statically indeterminate truss means it is not possible to find the unknowns in that particular truss and if we have m plus r value less than 2j then that is no longer a truss that is a mechanism so best example for a mechanism is drafter which is used for drawing purpose so you can see we can move this scale with the help of these links connected to each other so this cannot take load because there is a motion between the members so if m plus r is less than 2j then motion will happen between the members and that cannot be a truss that will be called as mechanism next we'll talk about stability of a truss in the previous slide we have learned about third equation where we said that if m plus r less than 2j then that particular structure cannot take loads it will be a mechanism because there will be a motion between the members fine so we can say that that particular structure is not stable it will collapse fine similarly we can say a truss can be unstable if it is a statically determinate or statically indeterminate means from the last example it is clearly visible that there is a motion between the members so it cannot take load that is not a stable structure it will collapse but apart from the third condition the first two conditions where the truss is statically determinate or statically indeterminate those trusses can also be unstable fine so we can judge the stability with the help of either through inspection or through force analysis so over here we have learned a very important point that uh, it doesn't matter whether a particular truss is statically determinate, statically indeterminate. It can still be unstable. Fine. So we can check the stability through inspection, through physical inspection or through force analysis. Now next we'll talk about zero force members. So let us quickly see what are zero force members. The members of the truss that support no loading are called zero force members means these are not used to take any load so forces in these members will be zero these are used in a truss for stability of a truss during construction and to provide support in case of change of loading so let us understand this uh, through examples so there are two cases for uh, zero force members let us see the case one when two members are connected at a joint at right angles to each other and no other external force acts at joint. So 
those will be zero force members like joint a so this is joint a you can see these two members are connected to each other and they are connected at right angles to each other and at this joint no other force is acting so if i have to make the free body of joint a what i will do i will represent joint a and uh, i will show forces in these two members one will act in horizontal direction one will act in y direction and we know this truss is in equilibrium so we can apply for uh, equations of equilibrium that is summation fx equal to 0 summation fy equal to 0 so when i will apply these two equations for this particular joint so that will directly tell us that fab equal to 0 faf equal to 0 why because in these two members af and ab there are no forces so we have concluded that if we have such structures where two members are connected to each other and angle between two members is 90 degree and no other force is acting at that joint then those two members will form zero force members next is case 2 zero force members also occurs at joints having geometry as joint D so one geometry is discussed over here you can see uh, this particular member that is DE DC and DA so if I have to draw the free body of these three members it will be like this only that from joint D one member is connected that is DE second member is connected that is DC and third member is connected at joint D that is DA so these two members are in line but DA is 90 degrees to those two members so if we consider x axis along this particular member and y axis along other two members which are at 90 degrees to this particular member then this particular member will be a zero force member so we can say summation fx equal to zero or summation or we can say force in this member that is da da will be equal to zero so this is the second condition if you get structures like this where three members are connected two are in line and third member is at 90 degrees to the previous two members then third member will be a zero force member so this we have to keep in our mind next we'll talk about analysis of statically determinate trusses of course in this particular unit we will learn how to find the unknowns of statically determinate trusses so for designing a truss we need to calculate forces in individual members weight of individual members are so small compared to load applied that it may be neglected yes when we have to do the calculations for the forces in different members of the truss during designing a truss then we ignore the weight of individual members of the truss because those weights are very very small as compared to the load they handle so we neglect the weight of the members during the calculations we use two methods uh, in order to determine different unknowns of a statically determinate trusses first method is called as method of joints and second method is called as method of sections basically method of joints is used to find the forces in all the members of the truss means suppose we have a condition that we have to analyze the forces in all the members of the truss then for that case we have to go for method of joints but suppose uh, we have a different situation and we just want to analyze few members of a particular truss only means let us say there are 20 members in a particular truss and uh, we are curious about let us say two or three members only because we feel that those three members are weak and uh, we have to find the forces in those three members only then in that case there is no need to uh, calculate the forces for all the members of the truss means there is no need to apply the method of joints we will go for method of sections because it is a quicker way to find the forces in particular part of a truss means in few members of a truss so that's why we say it leads to a quicker result in determining the forces in a few selected members of a truss so in this lecture we have seen uh, the definition of truss we have seen their applications we have seen different types of trusses and uh, we have learned about statically determinate and indeterminate trusses 
And we have seen that uh, if we want to find the unknowns in statically determinate trusses, there are two methods, method of joints and method of sections. So in coming lectures, we will discuss about these two methods. Thank you very much.